From McKinsey to Pepsi to wreck it and now Starbucks, Lakshman Narsimhan has seen a steaming rise to the top of an iconic American brand. Stepping into the shoes of the legendary Howard Schultz is daunting, but Narsimhan is taking each day cup by cup and store by store. Almost a year in, he's stirring up his strategy to make Starbucks even more global, doubling down on digitization and ensuring that the iconic coffee chain becomes much more of a lifestyle brand. Welcome to the Global Dialogue. I'm Shireen Bhan and we're at a Starbucks cafe in Pune. If you're wondering why you're here, well, the suspense is now being broken because we are joined by the global CEO of Starbucks, Lakshman Narsimhan. Pune boy, uh, Lakshman, thanks very much for joining us here on CNBC TV 18. And uh, this is really a special homecoming for you, isn't it? Oh, it is, actually. Thank you for coming here. Thank you for coming to my hometown. Thank you for coming to my home store. The Corrigan Park store is about 500 meters from where my mother taught mm. as a primary school teacher. And it's less than a kilometer from where I grew up. And so I've walked the street so many times, um, you know, as pretty much a nobody. And then you're coming here and, you know, it's amazing to see my hometown, my hometown partners, meet hometown customers. And it's glad, I'm so glad you are able to come to our no, I mean, I, I've been enjoying watching you behind the counter playing a barista, so, I, and you're not bad at it. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you for saying that. I mean, I actually earned my green apron, um, you know, when I started they training. They didn't give it to you? No, they didn't. They actually made it work. You know, so I had a trainer. She was, she was pretty tough. She would say, hey, there's too much foam in this latte. Go make it again. I got a bit of feedback today, too, by the way, as you probably saw. But, um, but it's actually really good to, uh, to know exactly how we do our things. Uh, so for six months I trained. Um, I trained in all the various aspects of the coffee business. I got a green apron, which is the first step. And uh, two weeks ago I got a black apron mm. because we've been working on knowledge all the way through. I've been working in stores half a day a month because our life is in these stores. It's with these partners. It's why I work. Mm. And so it's important to keep that going and to stay really connected to the team at the front line. You know, I want to understand from you, you've been doing this immersion exercise uh, now for the past eight months that you've been at Starbucks, but how do you cope with the baggage of expectations? How do you cope with the inevitable comparisons? You're at an American iconic institution, Starbucks, and you replace an iconic global CEO, Howard Schultz. How do you deal with that? Well, the first thing you've got to appreciate and acknowledge is the fact that Howard is iconic. The fact that he's a tremendous entrepreneur. Um, and he's redefined the way the world drinks coffee, and you've got to pay respect to it. Coming of Asian origin, that's actually easy to do. Mm. You know, when I was uh, first interviewed about this immersion program, and you know, a journalist asked me, you know, how could you agree to a six-month immersion? I looked at her and I said, you know, it's really interesting the way you word that question. Is it how could you do this immersion program for six months, um, or why was this immersion six months long? I said, if you were Asian, you might have asked the question differently. You would have mm. said, why was this immersion program only six months long? Mm. There's one simple word that changes, in fact, the perspective that you have around why you do this. I learned a lot from Howard. Um, but you also appreciate that I'm different. And um, if you start looking at the complementary skills that I bring, mm. that's what I'm going to bring to the brand. I deeply appreciate the brand. I know what it stands for. And it stands for human connection. It stands for ensuring that people have a place where they can belong, where mm. they can bring joy, uh, where the craft of coffee gives customers the results that they want. And we have the courage to keep innovating in the business. Those are our fundamental values. So as we were doing this, Howard and I had a long conversation about mm. the company. And we said, you know what? We've built this company. It's now 51 years old. We think the headroom for this company is really quite large. It's time for us to re-found this company. Mm, mm. And that's what my leadership team and I have done over the last year. We have re-founded the company. Mm. You go back to the mission of the company. The mission of the company that Howard had was a mission of, you know, uh, um, inspire and nurture the human spirit, one cup, one person, one neighborhood at a time. Tremendous mission. But it was written before the iPhone. Mm. And as you look at what's going on with the way customers are evolving, 
my leadership team and I, we worked with thousands of partners around the world, and we wanted to do something that gave the power of this cup mm. to the barista. Because really, that's where it happens. And so our mission celebrates the past and evolves the company to the future. And it is this, with every cup, with every conversation, with every community, we nurture the limitless possibilities of human connection. So the barista, when they hand the cup, they're having mm. a conversation with you, either physically or we do it digitally. Mm. The community is beyond just the neighborhood. What we're doing is we're essentially uncovering what the limitless possibilities are of us connecting mm. with each other. So the mission itself is different. You know, you're talking about limitless possibilities and limitless opportunities. Let me ask you that in the context of where you see this business now growing. Uh, you've put together a triple shot strategy for Starbucks, which involves cost savings, but it also involves accelerating your expansion plans around the world. What are you prioritizing today? And as you look at this world, in your words, with limitless possibilities, what is the role that you see Starbucks playing? So first of all, you know, as I said, this is, a, this is an iconic brand. And it's a brand that is founded on this idea of human connection. Um, it is a brand that is founded on this idea that even in a polarized world, you have the ability to create a third place, a place where people can come and feel belonging, feel joy, and essentially advance the conversation forward. Um, you know, with the ability to converse, to connect. And so that is at the heart of what this company is. So given that that company is there, uh, and given this is a business that's founded on kindness and joy, it's an iconic brand that needs to be celebrated. So we're not a political organization. You know, we're not a, um, you know, we don't fund governments mm. or, um, you know, we strongly are opposed to hate speech. You know, we completely decry you know, the weaponized speech that exists in many places. And there's all kinds of rumors of who we are and what we're about. Mm. But the fact is that, you know, we strongly uh, reject um, violence against the innocent. What we are about is we're about pro-belonging, pro-joy, pro-kindness. That's what this brand is about. So given that's what the brand is about, and we look at the world, you know, I worked in stores around the world. Mm. I could see society through the windows of our stores. And it's interesting when you go to the US and you see you know, a more polarized society. You come to Europe and you see a highly more multicultural customer base as well as partner base. I go to Japan and I see older customers coming in with their even older parents in the afternoon to share coffee. You go to China and you see this amazing ambition that the youth have. We as a brand play a real role, a role of providing that, the world's third place. To that end, we said this triple shot and reinvention was about, first, it's about elevating the brand. Get the brand, take it even better. The second is about us strengthening and scaling digital. Mm. Now, we're a very digital business, and we have the potential to make it even bigger in what mm. we do, how we connect with our customers, but also how we reimagine the factory in the back mm. while delivering the theater in the front, the theater that you saw. <laughs> the third thing you, we have is truly global, and this is where India comes in too. Mm. You know, we have a big leg in the US. We've, of course, grown several stores in China, but the rest of the world has huge potential for us. Mm. Even in markets like Western Europe, we have headroom. You look at markets like India, we're just getting started. Yeah. So we will be truly global. Three out of four stores that we build over the next five years will be outside the US. Mm. Those three things are really important. And to that context, you know, we need to obviously fund this. So efficiency helps us do it. It helps us build the capabilities mm. that really reinforce this business. And the last thing, and perhaps the most important thing for me, is you know, we have 460,000 partners around the world. These are partners hired locally. Mm. They're hired by you know, the local geographic partners that we have. Here we have an amazing joint venture with Tata's. These are people from the community mm. that we're working with. But how we ensure that we, through the power of storytelling, through the power of amplifying what's really important, we reinvigorate our partner culture worldwide. It's amazing, you know, we don't really have a system of transporting and transposing our culture. Mm. But you go to Mexico, or you go to Holland, or you go to you know, Japan, or you come here to India, mm. it actually feels very similar. So that's what Triple Shot Reinvention is. And you know, what it does is it gives us a comp growth of 5% in the long term, double digit revenue growth, and earnings growth in the 15 plus percent range. All that put together helps us you know, create a financial result. Well, in so doing, we meet the needs of all the stakeholders. We have partners, customers, mm. the farmers and coffee, the community, as well as the environment.
Well, since we are here in India, let's talk about your India plans and your joint venture with the Tatas. Uh, well, close to 400 stores in India. What do you see that number being over the next few years? Uh, give me a sense of the kind of expansion we should expect. Well, first of all, I'm really excited by India and what is happening here. You and I just discussed this earlier. You know, I've come to Pune and it looks so different. We see the investments being made in infrastructure. We see the consumer, um, you know, getting great strength. Uh, the country is poised for takeoff. Uh, and our business has been built very systematically over the course of the last 10 years with a base of partners who are extremely strong and a partner like the Tatas where the values are entirely consistent. Chandra and I have known each other for years and, you know, it's a very similar orientation mm. uh, to India, the potential of India and where we could go. Um, what we have announced is the fact that, you know, we're going to be opening, um, if you look at last year, we opened one store every five days. We're now moving to one store every three days. Mm. And we have a wonderful team leading the business, and I'm deeply supportive and appreciative of all that they do. And when they told me one store in three days, I said, that's amazing, well done. What are we now doing for the other two days? Mm. And I think what this tells you a little bit is the ambitions for India. So what are for, you going to be doing for the other two well, days? <laughs> the team is on it. <laughs> the team is working, obviously, on things to do. But, um, you know, what I appreciate very much is beverage and coffee score. And I love the coffee culture that we're building. Um, you know, food attaches the business that we have. And we're going to range of food products that attach to the beverages that we have that are terrific and that will be well done. We're working on things that are accessible, the Pico price point, the filter coffee that you drank. Mm. Um, and so all that's just for mm. India. But in addition to that, what may not be entirely visible to you is the work we're doing behind the scenes. You know, um, in Cork, uh, the Tatas and us have a joint venture. We work uh, very much on farming mm. and how we improve the quality of the coffee crop. Uh, we have a joint venture with Tata Coffee on roasting here in India. It's very important to build the back end mm. and to build the back end really, really well. And my hope and ambition is that we fundamentally scale up even further the coffee we source from India. Mm. So if you look at the new launch we're going to have this year, early this year here in India, it's going to be the Starbucks Reserved Monsooned Malabar. That's a, a tremendous blend. I drank it actually the other day. Huh. This is going to be in all U.S. stores in the middle of the year. Mm. So we're going to take India, what we make here, what we produce here, and also have it show up around the world. Mm. And it's a way of taking India to the world as well. So, so how much are you sourcing currently from India and how much do we expect that to be over the next five years? I think to me what you could expect is that as we continue to work together, Tatas and us, on coffee, the quality of coffee from the farming, we bring in the techniques that we have mastered by working with half a million farmers with whom we buy. You know, we provide information to another million and a half, two million mm. farmers of the 20 million worldwide who actually get information practices from us. We're bringing the whole set of practices as well here, including what we call cafe practices, which ensure the future of coffee for all in the mm. chain. And so we bring that in here. The idea very much is to say, how do you make India even bigger for us? And clearly India is a tea drinking uh, culture too. So uh, there's things we do with tea around the world. So I'm really hopeful that what we can do is fundamentally change the equation about how we take India to the world through Starbucks. So what is that going to mean in terms of incremental investments here in India, whether it is to beef up your store plans or it is to enhance procurement? What is it going to mean in terms of the kind of money that you are going to invest in India over the next few years? We have a very long-term view to investment and returns. And uh, what we know we're doing is we're creating a third leg of the stool uh, in our global markets. As far as India is particularly concerned, the team knows that, um, you know, the brand and how we deliver the brand is really very important. The values are super critical for us. And uh, with that, the team is essentially working on a plan, you know, continuing to build the plan we already have mm. to ensure that we get the kind of returns in the long term that we would get. But, you know, with opportunities, we will invest. And you can expect in India that we will invest. So where would you see India in the global pecking order when it comes to revenue contribution to Starbucks? I mean, the, the lion's share still is the U.S. and China today. But what do you see over the next five to ten years in terms of India's contribution? Well, China's ten or less than ten percent of, of the overall, you know, revenues for us globally. The U.S. is obviously a lion's size of it. But we actually have a lot of other markets. We're in 86 countries. You've got to recognize the potential of the headroom we have in all of them as we build out this uh, third leg of the stool. India's at about 400 stores, but we have 38,000 stores globally. Our plan is to get to 55,000 stores over the course of the next five years, with three out of the four stores being outside of the US. India will also have a big role in this.
let's talk about demand and let's talk about demand in the short to medium term, specifically as far as the U.S. is concerned. While uh, I think it's clear now that we're not talking about a hard landing anymore and the talk of recession is over, but what are you seeing in terms of consumer sentiment, in terms of discretionary spending, and what's the outlook over the, the short to medium term? I think in the U.S., the U.S. is going through, will go through this year, a transition year, as we sort of come out of COVID, come out of all the you know, the, the money and everything else that the consumers had. And so this year is a transition here that will lead to more normalization of the consumer environment in the U.S. As far as our demand goes, which I can speak to more specifically, if you look at our loyal customers, uh, our loyal customers continue to frequent us very often. They continue to trade up. They continue to customize what they do. Be very good about the strength of the brand with our loyal customers. Uh, and I fully expect that as the environment normalizes over time, we will continue to see growth in a market like the U.S. for us. Mm. We are underpenetrated in the U.S. Uh, we are underpenetrated in the U.S., even though we have 16,000 stores. And I think the opportunity for us to grow in the U.S. too is high. You know, when you talk about uh, the, the theatrics in the front and using the theater, not the theater. theatrics, it's theater, a theater. theater. Yes. Uh, and, and, the, uh, and the stuff that goes on at the back the end. The factory in the back. The factory at the back end. <laughs> and the yeah. digitization that's helping yes. keep the factory moving along. What kind of spends do you expect on the digitization front? And what is that going to translate into? What are the changes that you're making both at the front as well as the back end? And the results that you're seeing on, on account of that already? I think part of uh, what... I saw working in the stores is I actually got a very visceral feeling for what we were doing well and what we could do better. You know, we don't get it right all the time. We just don't. I mean, we're, you know, 460,000 humans and there are mistakes that we make at times or things that we could do better. So I think if I look at the, if I look at the ability for us with a factory at the back as we think about the supply chain and what we can do to drive productivity, how technology can actually enable us in doing that. We're already beginning a lot of work in that space. In China, you already see us having made material progress in that. And it is something we'll do in the US, but also do in other markets. Technology plays a bigger enabler in this. It plays an enabler for us in farming mm. and how we think about actually driving crop productivity in a sustainable manner. It's about how we organize the supply chain. It's about how we you know, get product to where it's needed. Technology plays a big role also in mm. the theater in the front, mm. how we connect with customers, how we give them an experience that is seamless. So there's work and investment going in both areas. And the best way to think of it is that we need to take away money from things that don't create a lot of value mm. and put a lot more money into things that could, very simply put. So where are so, you taking the money out of? Well, for example, in the supply chain side, we see a lot of potential for us to be far better at what we do, how we buy, what we buy, how we flow, how we ensure products are available, the inventory that we have in various places, improvements that we can make there. That tees up money and that helps us actually make investments, including in areas like technology. But even in technology, there are things that we can do differently. Mm. You know, there are savings that we can get in terms of, you know, how we actually take money away from run and uh, put more money into innovate. Mm. And we're working through the architecture, the investments we make at the app layer, how we bring AI into the equation. Mm. You know, we've built an AI platform for the last five years. We call it Deep Brew. That actually powers a lot of what we do at Starbucks. And it's a, you know, artificial intelligence machine learning platform. With Gen AI coming in, mm. that's gonna get powered up even more. So I think we have the ability with technology to really support the growth ambitions of the business. You saw, you, you saw us make an announcement of a partnership with Microsoft, a partnership with Apple for some of the Apple products mm. that we use, as well as a partnership with Amazon for some of the payment systems that we have for the US. So I think those are the things that we're using anyway, but the thought very much is that technology can play a big enabler in how we make our factory at the back better while really enabling the theater in the front. You know, you talked about the legacy of the past 50 years and you talked about how the brand is going to evolve. In terms of where you see the brand and its positioning, how much of that do you believe is likely to change given the dynamics that are changing in the marketplace? You've now got artisanal brands, you've got VC funded, a whole plethora of brands, including here in India. Where do you see Starbucks fitting in? How do you see the brand positioning changing, if at all? So first of all, the brand is, is iconic because of the fact that what it stands for is in some ways timeless. When you stand for human connection, it is timeless. And so there's different manifestation of how this brand can appear, right? Uh, we have a Starbucks Reserve brand that actually plays at the higher end and provides a very different set of experiences. Is that going to be a priority in terms of growth and accelerating the expansion on that front? I don't think it's a priority for growth per se, but it's clearly a priority for us in terms of how we set the brand, the experiences that it provides, 
we have one reserve store in India right now in Fort in Bombay. We're going to open a second next year. Uh, if you look at the US, we have the roastery, which is a destination mm. for experiences that we provide. So beyond the, uh, the brand, which is a timeless positioning, clearly what we do with innovation, how we digitally connect with customers, how we ensure that we deliver a consistent experience worldwide, there's still so much headroom. I understand that there'll be others that come in that may have a different proposition, but what I think about very much is how do we scale this and how do we do this at scale mm. in the 38,000 or 55,000 stores we have worldwide if we did it more consistently, the opportunities are even more, you know, apparent to us. Mm. So what will be the, the growth regions that you are going to be focused on? Of course, you talked about India as being one of the growth markets that you will invest a lot of your time, energy and money in. But outside of India, which are the markets that you're going to be focused on to drive the expansion and growth? Shireen, you'll be amazed. You know, when you look at our brand and you look at where it is, there's headroom in every market. You know, everybody said Japan is a slow growing market. You know, we have 2,800 stores in Japan. And the number of stores in Japan is going to increase even further just because of what we have. We have some really beautifully crafted stores in Japan. And it does a phenomenal job in bringing the coffee culture into Japan. So Japan is a growth market in that mm. sense, if you see what I'm saying. But the rest of the world, we're underpenetrated. We're underpenetrated Western Europe. Um, we have opportunities in the Middle East. In Africa, we're not even really present in many markets. Latin America, there's real headroom too. So everywhere you look, there's possibilities. So what we're trying to do is ensure that we build the capabilities, we build a global mindset, we build the supply chain, we build the capabilities around store and store development, and we build 4,000 stores worldwide every year. Every single store is designed by us. It's unique, it's different, and it's important for it to be so, so we don't have a cookie cutter model to this. But in order to do that, we can also do those with scale with technology. So that's going to be the focus. So there's growth potential everywhere. We're building the capabilities to support that. You know, in India specifically, you talked about the joint venture with the Tatas and what you're intending to do more on the procurement side. Uh, more, more JVs, more partnerships, more collaboration here in India that you would explore? Or, or, and what has been the big learning from this particular joint venture? I think um, if you look at Starbucks, one of the secret sources is how the culture has in some ways diffused globally across all its stores but it hasn't been done in the way that you'd normally think about it. Hard-edged and top-down. Starbucks is a right-brained company. And because it's a right-brained company, people, relationships really matter at scale. Mm. And it's the reason why you see we spend more time in the front line in stores. You know, one of the things about Starbucks is, uh, unlike some of the other companies, which are more left-brained, when you go into a company that's more left-brained, you morph to what that company is. In a company like ours, which is right-brained, people come in and they tell you their story. Mm. And what they tell you is, I'm bringing my story into the company. Now together, let's make something more powerful. It's actually quite unique. Now, when you think about that and start saying, you know, what could this really lead to? It can lead to massive growth. Now, we've chosen geographic partners very carefully. And it's been driven by fit, values fit. You know, we have a partner in the Middle East, our Shire group out of Kuwait. It's 25 years with them. Uh, same thing with Latin America and Europe. Here too with the Tatars. Culture and fit really matters to us. So when we create geographic partners, we do it for the really long term. We're not in the process of you know, changing every three years. We just don't do that. Now we have collaborations that we do with artists. If you look at Blackpink, uh, which is a K-pop group across uh, you know, um, the Asia Pacific, great collaboration with them. We have one with Malish Malhotra that's coming out, I think, in the, in the next couple of weeks here in India. And I think you'll see us play more of those as we think about going into lifestyle, what we do. We did, you know, something in Milan with the Milan Fashion Show. You know, we've done Are you likely to be much more of a lifestyle company going forward or much more of a lifestyle brand going forward? This brand, when you talk about human connection, it's a brand that it can actually appeal to a lot. Um, and it really is a kindness, joy-driven brand. It's not driven by all this crap that you read on social media, the disinformation and all of it exists. It is generally built around this idea of human connection. So you can see us elevate the brand and you can see us where it goes. We just did a partnership with Oprah Winfrey around the idea of the color of uh, the color purple, which we launched over Christmas. That's what this brand is about. We're trying to bring human connection to bear and we'll use that in a way through various interpretations of it 
in terms of what the brand could be. You know, I heard you ask uh, your team here to give you advice. Uh, what do they have to say to you? Well, uh, first of all, they wanted me to work more with them, which <laughs> is great. Thank you, and I intend to do that, and uh, I like that. They gave me some ideas around sizing, around what we could do to make our products more accessible. You know, we've launched Pico, which is a size in India for the first time, and actually it's one that I think people can try our products and get, you know, get into the brand, so to speak, in a more accessible manner. I've had other feedback around, you know, uh, and this is, really shows me the ambition of young India. Uh, the ambition of young India is, a, is remarkable. There are, you know, 40% of our baristas are, are women. You know, we have women-only stores. And when I look at the work of participation of women in India, it's really an opportunity. No feedback on the chai latte? Oh. <laughs> I think, well, there was a lot of feedback on the chai latte. I even saw the Spider-Man movie where they put that in the script. I'm like, really? <laughs> well, Lakshman, it's been an absolute pleasure. Many thanks for joining us. We wish you the very best of luck uh, here in India and, of course, uh, with Starbucks globally. Look forward to seeing more of you back home. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And thank you for coming here to my hometown. My pleasure. And uh, really, this is my hood. It is, it is your hood and it's, it's good to be here in your hood experiencing Starbucks with you. Thanks very much for your thank time. Thank you, Shireen. Thank you That's for coming. That's a wrap on this edition of Global Dialogue from all of us here on the team. For now, goodbye and thanks very much for watching.